You know, if somebody comes to me and tells me they don't practice any kind of religion, they don't practice Christianity, and they want me to drive out a demon, I say no, I'm not going to do it. For your own benefit, I'm not going to do it. Because if I do that, and then you go back to your same old lifestyle, that demon comes back, Scripture says, with seven others, and uh, you'll be worse off than ever. So you have to change and repent and come back to Christ. That's You have to do that if you want to stay clean, if you want the demons to, to stop harassing you. And sometimes people don't want to do it. I've had people say flat out, I'm not going back to church. And I say, okay. Well, good luck. I can't help you. You know, and maybe when things get worse, they come back and eventually they, they come to their senses. But bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God again. As always, I'd like to start the video by thanking all of you for being here with us. And hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. And there are three rather long clips of Father Carlos Martins and Father Daniel Rehill that I've included here. In the case of Father Martins' clips, I cannot make it any shorter because for me to remove the earlier part of the clip would make it confusing to only share the later part of the clip. So I hope you don't mind that I do it this way. But in any case, there are so many things all of us can learn from the clips of Father Martins here though. And I will kick this off with a call that Father Rehill received during his radio show on Radio Maria. So I have a question um, that's recently come up. We have a young adult son living at home with us while he's kind of going to school, trying to get his life back together again. And he um, lives in the basement of our house um, in a home, in a, it's nicely done. We've redone the space, um, but he's moved back into it. And um, he struggles off and on with depression and, you know, and addictions and things like that. And he was, you know, trying to recently get his life back together. I'd like to straighten up his life and try to live better um, in the last week and a half or two. Um, and I was so proud of him and I was just encouraging him. And But then he says, Mom, I woke up in the middle of the night and I felt something dark staring at me from my closet. He goes, it felt like it was just evil and just looking at me. And it... It, it freaked me out because of all his struggles he's had in the past. And I, I said I wanted to have a priest come bless the house. I was telling him last night, and I said, it's specifically your room. And he he got so verbally, like, combative with me. He says, no way. No one's coming in my room. And and he says, I'll lock the doors. I'll, you know. And I'm like, but it's, you know, so I don't really know where to go from here because I feel like with all his struggles, I wouldn't be surprised if there's just something, you know, yeah. Set. Well, how old is he? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. And is is your husband still in the picture? He is. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is a simple conversation. You know, you're living here purely by our goodwill because we're trying to help you. But make no mistake about it, that is not your room. We own that room. You get to live in it while you're staying here uh, for a short time. So that room will be blessed, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you can I, go back and fend for yourself. That's what I told him to some extent last night. And it, it should come from both of you, yeah. you know, your your husband too. And that's you true. know, just remind him, you know, we're we're here for you, but you're going to play by our rules if you're living in our house. This is the way it's always been, and it doesn't change just because you you grew up. And you know what? You know, we want you to get healthy, but this is part of the process. We have to make sure the house is rid of anything that could be causing a problem. Clearly, you have a problem, which is not going to go away until a priest comes and expels that thing out of your closet. So you can either sleep in fear every night. But to be honest, I wouldn't even give him the option because, you know, that's going to start creating chaos for you and your husband and the whole house will have a problem. Exactly. Yes, getting. I so need to get my husband involved. You have to be a little firm with him. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Part of me worries that it's like something that, you know, like is there something attached to him that's kind of creating part of this problem with him being so against having well, a it blessing. Could be. It could be, room. but you know, if he's there when the priest comes, and the priest should really be doing a deliverance prayer, not just the blessing. 
uh, then you'll you'll find out then because the thing will manifest within him, and then you'll know. But you know, if he's still speaking with you and on you know civil terms most of the time, he's not possessed, but he could have an attachment demon attached. Those get broken off into confessionals. So the other thing you might want to mention is when's the last time you went to confession? That's something I've been encouraging them to do. It's been a while. It's been a while, quite a few years. So these these are all ways High school, to probably. The, the issue. Yeah. Anyway, I saw a comment a few days ago, and let me read it out for you here. I was watching your content for the stories of good fighting evil. I'm not enjoying as much, even though it's okay. Constructive criticism. Add more of the content that made you popular. Well, for one, allow me to politely address this. While I do not share too much about exorcisms and priests explaining about this demon and that demon, what do you think spiritual warfare really is? If we are not on firm footing in regards to our faith, wouldn't that make it much easier for the enemy to attack us? And so I hope that when all of us are listening to these exorcists talking about other things other than exorcisms, you can see why it is important for us to be educated as a whole, not simply to be entertained when listening to exorcists like Father Chad Ripperger casting out Demon ABC. Anyway, if it's about battling good versus evil that people are looking for, I'll include this clip here from Father Martins. And today I would, I would like to talk about holy orders. The configuration of men to perform the action of Christ as deacon, as priest, and as bishop. And you know, all of the sacraments, so teaches the church, are for the sake of one sacrament, and that is the Eucharist. Uh, so we baptize people in order to be able to give them the Eucharist. Uh, all of the other sacraments receive their meaning through the great sacrament of the Eucharist. And so in order to give the church the Eucharist, our Lord instituted a priest who instituted holy orders. Uh, he instituted the, the sacrament by which he would configure men unto himself. And I'll share with you two stories where that became very evident to me shortly after my ordination. And upon, uh, shortly after ordination, I was asked to undertake the ministry uh, of deliverance and exorcism. Distance, I knew that, that the demon was manifesting himself and that I was interacting not with the man, but with the demon. And so at a certain point, I compelled the demon to answer in the name of Christ uh, because he had been in ignoring me to that point, I said to him, I compel you to do this, and I order you to tell me who in fact is compelling you. And the response from the demon was Christ himself. That in receiving that command from me, who he was hearing was Christ. The set second example is even more visceral. And I remember there was a funeral that I had celebrated for someone, uh, for uh, a wonderfully, wonderfully pleasant gentleman. Uh, his name was Bill, and uh, at the, the, the family had, I'd given them the option to pick the readings, and they, they asked me if I would pick them myself. And one of my favorite readings is the Raising of Lazarus. And it's one of my favorites because it reveals an aspect of Christ that is just singularly unique. And Christ is filled with grief at the death of his friend. And then at a certain point, he asks where Lazarus has been laid. And so they take him to the place and it says, and now our English translation usually renders the passage into English as Jesus was filled with emotion. Um, I have seen some Protestant translations which say he snorted. And the verb in Greek that is used is a very, very specific verb. It is a verb used only in one context ever in the Greek language, and that is it refers to that 
that bellowing or that snort, if you will, that a bull makes just before he charges. And if you ever want to see what that looks like, go on YouTube, type in snorting bull and watch videos of it. A bull will snort so hard that even uh, that that there will be a cloud of mucus that comes out of him, a cloud of, of, of vapor that, that will become visible uh, as, as an expression of his anger. And that, and that is usually done before he charges. So the gospel writer uses that to convey what is inside Christ. There's, there's an angry bull he is angry at death. He is angry that his friend has, has had to taste death and now his lifeless body is lying in a tomb. So that, that emotion that, that takes over Christ, right, that is present in Christ, is for the sake of us and, and for the sake of Lazarus, who in this case represents all of us. This is the love that God has for us. In this one uh, case, I was diagnosing, I'd been asked to, to, to diagnose someone, this time it was a, it was a woman, um, whether there was the demonic present within her. And there was one clue that in, in my interacting with her, I, there was nothing obvious that would denote the presence of the evil one as opposed to um, a personality trait or perhaps a mental or emotional illness on her part. But what happened is this was during the same week as Bill's funeral where I had just preached on that passage uh, of the raising of Lazarus. And at a certain point, there was a stubbornness that was expressed uh, that was present in the woman in my asking her questions, interrogating her, if you will. And at a certain point, I got up and I moved forward to put my hands on, on the top of her head and pray. And so I did so. It was afterwards when the, the, the session of praying was done that she said to me, Father, when you got up out of that chair and you came to me, I was terrified. I said, why? Because I didn't see you coming to me. I saw a raging bull. Uh, subsequently, I, in, in, upon her saying that to me, I prayed more direct prayers and then there was a manifestation of evil. Uh, and so when, when evil, when, the, when a demon is present within someone, you have two souls, if you will, contained within one body. And the experience of one merges into the experience of the other. Uh, and they're both fighting for control of that body. It's, it's, it's a terrible state for someone who is in that predicament. But what she revealed was what the demon was actually viewing that in that experience, that the experience of the demon seeing me coming, he sees a raging bull, and she was allowed to experience that reality as the demon would. Uh, and so friends, the priesthood is a great gift. The priest, through no merit of his own, but through the merit of Christ, performs the action of Christ. It is a great grace. Uh, Christ configures him mystically uh, and he does so uh, to a deacon and to a bishop as well in a different way. But of course, we rely on the priesthood to feed us weekly uh, on the, the Eucharist. And so. And now for the last clip of Father Martin's that I'd like to include here, where he talks about anointing of the sick. And for this one, I really hope that our Protestant brothers and sisters watching this video will be able to learn more about the Catholic faith. And I'd like to talk about the anointing of the sick today. Um, the sacrament of the sick, as it is also known, uh, and it used to be called, and could still be called, I think, extreme unction. And you know that the sacraments, or the theology behind the sacraments, is 
an evolving thing within the church in the sense that the church is given the sacraments by Christ and the church is tasked with administering them and the church as it does so deepens its understanding of the sacraments the sacrament of uh, of the anointing of the sick or extreme unction has certainly uh, the church has certainly gained a deeper understanding case in point um, it used to be the practice of the church that people could get extreme unction once in their life that it was a sacrament given for the transition for that journey from this life into the next the church uh, has deepened its understanding no it is clearly in the scriptures a sacrament also for healing in addition to that transition to the next life in other words uh, it is given to the sick uh, james uh, the apostle in his epistle speaks of it and it is given for the sick for the it is given to the sick for the sake of healing and so the church now anybody who is has a serious illness not just a cold or maybe they're a little down because the sun hasn't come out for a few days but but a genuine sickness a, a sickness that could threaten life could um, and the church is very loose with that um, arthritis could threaten life arthritis would be a good reason to receive the sacrament of the sick but the sacrament has a really beautiful part to it and that is that aside from the fact that one receives Christ through the sacrament receives him in in the state of one's sickness Christ enters into the person in a new and different way but the sacrament itself absolves sins for those who cannot make their confession uh, so the sacrament of confession is the ordinary way in which sins are forgiven it is the intent of Christ to have sins forgiven ordinarily through that sacrament that's his plan that's what he wants we give God what he wants but if someone is unable to make a confession and you're only obliged to do what you are able to do the sacrament of the sick removes sins all sins so if someone is in the state of unconsciousness receives the sacrament of the sick this is of course presuming they are baptized the, the sacrament is ineffective to one who is unbaptized the person could be baptized and if they had never been baptized then that sacrament uh, removes each and every sin but sins are removed in those who are unable to confess in the sacrament of the sick and many times I have driven up on a roadside seeing an, seen an accident of course as a priest I keep oils in my car I keep a small stool and very importantly I keep the formula of the sacrament always on my person it's always tucked in my wallet why I mean uh, the, the lines of the sacrament are, are not long I mean um, first the priest anoints the forehead saying through this holy anointing may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit and of course I would have dipped my hand in the oil of the sick uh, the oil of the infirm also known uh, and then once the forehead is anointed both hands are anointed while the priest says may the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up these are not long lines right easily memorized but you can come up on a scene that is wild it is bloody it is tragic and you don't want to fool around with trying to remember you pull out the card and you read the card that way there's no chance of you making an error in the formula because you yourself can be so stunned by what you see after the sacrament of the sick the church gives uh, an astounding grace uh, and that is a plenary indulgence given in articulo mortis at the time of death so if it looks like there is a chance that somebody may not make it then 
after the sacrament of the sick, the church, can, the church grants to the priest the ability to grant a plenary indulgence, meaning all the, the accrued pur purgation necessary through purgatory before entering into heaven is removed for the person receiving that indulgence. And so that is likewise not a long formula. Through the holy mysteries of our redemption, may Almighty God release you from all punishments in this life and in the life to come. May he open to you the gates of paradise and welcome you into everlasting joy. Poof. The person dies in that state without committing any further sin. When that person exits this world, enters immediately into heaven. And this is true even for people who, uh, on their deathbed, did not want final confession, did not want friendship with God. But as long as they are baptized, if they are unconscious and cannot resist the sacrament, uh, because the church believes, we all believe as Christians, that we are created for God. Right? And somebody who is in his right mind right, ought to desire God. If someone does not desire God, he or she is not in his right mind. And when that, when such a person, if and when that such that person is unconscious, the church continues to offer the sacrament. I will continue to offer the sacrament. If there is no resistance upon the person, I administer the sacrament. And the person could have, could be in a state of horrendous sin. All of that sin is removed. Now, the objection to that, uh, which is a logical objection, is somebody could say, well, look, this person didn't have faith. This person, um, or whatever faith they have, was insufficient because they weren't really willing to do things God's way. Or this person had definitively rejected God, which uh, there are people like that. Uh, none of that is, is, amounts to a reason to not administer the sacrament. Uh, in, in articulo mortis, in when somebody is done. Why doesn't it? Well, the person may not have faith, but the church has faith, and that faith is sufficient. And the church has, through baptism, gained the right to be the mother of every Christian. And so if a child is not in his right mind, the church speaks on behalf of that child and takes custody of the soul. And so that's why we don't hesitate to give people the sacraments when they are unable to resist, even if they have resisted uh, in the past. And now for the second part of the video, there are a couple of things that I'd like to share with you here. And to kick this off, Father Joseph Iannuzzi was asked this question before. Why did not God intervene and try to dissuade Adam from committing the original sin? And in his written answer, this is Father Iannuzzi's reply. The church teaches that God is omniscient and God knows all things before they exist and all events before they occur. And God foreknew that Adam and Eve would sin, but that he nevertheless decided to create them in view of his eternal son's redemption, whose foreseen merits would redeem them. As to why God did not intervene and stop Adam and Eve from committing original sin, the answer is this. God never violates the free human will whose aptitude to choose good or evil enables it to merit heaven and inherit eternal happiness or demerit heaven and consequently deserve eternal punishment. God no more forces the free human will to do his will than the Son of God forced Judas Iscariot to convert and avoid betrayal. Rather, God invites us to convert, believe in the gospel, and be saved, while he leaves us free to accept or reject this invitation. The free human will is the most sacred and precious creation in God's eyes, as it is the faculty of the soul that enables it to merit heaven by passing the tests God present to it in life, and in so doing, prove its loyalty to God. And then there's one more thing that I'd like to include in this video, about a remote Siberian town that kept faith for 62 years without a priest. So this particular town is populated by descendants of Polish migrants who spent six decades without a priest under communist rule, but somehow the people kept the faith alive. The village of Vershima is located in Siberia and is inhabited almost exclusively by people of Polish descent. It lies in a small valley surrounded by mountains and the soil is fertile. There's actually only one road leading to town, and a very bumpy one at that. And winters are very cold. In the entire village, 
There's only one place with cell phone coverage which is at the cemetery. And there is no internet access and the conditions are quite extreme, but according to the locals, one can get used to them eventually. Vershina was founded in 1910 by Polish settlers who emigrated there. The village, which is located about 87 miles from Irkutsk, is a phenomenon. In remote Siberia, its residents have preserved the language of their ancestors for generations. There's also a Polish parish in Vershina and the church was built by Polish immigrants as early as 1915. It functioned until 1928 or 1929 when the communist authorities decided to demolish it. However, this intention was abandoned as a result of protests by residents. Nevertheless, eventually the Bolsheviks closed the church and devastated its interior. The faith survived, cultivated secretly within families. No Eucharist was celebrated there for 62 years. During that time, one of the residents, Magdalena Micah, baptized the town's children and the residents prayed on their own, thus saving the Polish language and native piety. They also tried to keep Catholic holidays, with the exception of Easter. They had no contact with Poland, so they didn't have calendars and they didn't know when Resurrection Sunday fell. The parish was reborn after the fall of communism in Russia. The first priest to revisit the village was Father Tadeusz Pikus. He celebrated Mass in a school building in 1990, and he also later negotiated with the local authorities to give the church building back to the faithful and restore its sacred character, instead of the government proposal of creating a museum at the site. And a lot of people came to that first Mass. Many adults saw a priest for the first time in their lives. Those who were born after the church was closed may have been in their 60s and had never been to Mass. And then two years later, on December 19, 1992, the first Mass was celebrated in the restored church. It was presided over by Bishop Joseph Wirth. And this is how the liturgy was reborn in the town. The reality of the resurrection and the presence of Christ in bread and wine is there again after many years. Today, there are more than 500 people living in Vershina, and the youngest of them are the sixth generation of descendants of Polish emigrants. According to a Catholic priest serving there during Christmas, he visited 111 families and nine families were not at home. There are 120 families in the village and the priest went with an altar server who is 70 years old. The mass attendance is low because the residents of the town are not taught to go to church, although they emphasize their devotion to God. Well then, that will be all for the video this time. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And hopefully all of you have learned a lot from the compilation this time. Anyway, for those of you who would like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below and from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, everybody, for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. And until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you.